let's begin with our first presentation by Andrew on cluster randomized control trials. Hi everybody, and uh, thank you, Dorita, for the uh, for the introduction. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here today um, presenting on some recent work I've done with uh, a large cluster randomized crossover trial embedded in a clinical registry. Oh, sorry, organisers, I don't have uh, I don't have mouse control here to move the slides. Sorry, everybody, uh, we've had a few technical hitches. Ah, yes, okay, we're in action now, that's great. Um, so an outline of what I'll talk about here in this brief 20 minute talk, um, I'm Figuring most of you signed up for a registry randomized trials know what these are, but I'll, because this is the first talk, I'll give a very, very quick overview of my impression what registry randomized trials are. Then I'll talk about individually randomized trials and then show a variant of trial designs called cluster randomized trial designs. Then moving on to a further variant about cluster randomized crossover designs, that's cluster randomized trials with a crossover element to it and the benefits that can be achieved from that. And throughout I'll be making reference to a large cluster crossover registry embedded trial called the PEPTIC trial that was uh, recently published. So it'll be like the running example throughout. And then I'll close with some comments about cluster randomized trials and cluster crossover trials embedded within registries. Okay, so very briefly, uh, registry randomized trials, um, a randomized trials conducted within a registry. They have high internal validity because of the randomization element. Um, they've got high external validity because by the nature of the registry, they're real world patients. And in terms of conducting trials within a registry, you, you don't have to go and essentially find the patients they're there within the registry, so you can have sparse recruitment as well. Consent needs to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis, but I'll be talking about cases where you might have a waiver or opt-out consent, which uh, facilitates the, uh, the trial even further. And ideally, all follow-up outcomes would be routinely collected within the registry. The downside of registry randomized trials, this is my personal opinion here, is you get what you get. The endpoints in the registry might not be exactly what you would have chosen if you were designing a non-registry randomized trial from scratch. The data quality is only as good as the registry data quality. And you may not have available, I call auxiliary variables, other, other variables or factors that are relevant to the trial, but may not be captured within the registry, such as uh, treatment compliance, biomarkers or subgroups. So the examples I'm going to be uh, looking at um, here in my talk are in the intensive care area, because that's been my uh, area, prim a principal area of application here. And I'll talk about the potential for registry trials in intensive care where the types of interventions we're talking about are near universal interventions for physiological safety of patients. And I've got a little diagram here of an intensive care patient who's mechanically ventilated. So there could be comparative effectiveness type questions about oxygen saturation levels. Um, the, the mechanical ventilation makes them prone to uh, stress ulcers. So what sort of interventions for that? And that will be my main application focus here. Also the nutrition per day, how many calories per day, and uh, the patients need to be hydrated. What sort of fluid balance do they have? So these are all uh, comparative effectiveness questions of routinely used interventions here. And the registry that we are so fortunate to have available is the Australian New Zealand Adult Patient Database. This is a comprehensive registry of intensive care patients across Australia and New Zealand, it's updated quarterly. 
and it has admission characteristics, length of stay both of intensive care and in the overall hospital length of stay, so hospital mortality and some key clinical monitoring characteristics throughout. So if these are the endpoints you're interested in, then this registry is a very convenient source for conducting a trial within. So the specific example question that I'll be looking at here is about the stress ulcer prophylaxis in mechanically ventilated patients. Now, the vast majority of uh, vented patients in ICUs receive some form of stress ulcer prophylaxis. The most common are uh, proton pump inhibitors, which I'll abbreviate as PPIs, and histamine 2 receptor blockers, H2RBs. So now these are used differentially across different sites and the variation has more to do with the physician and hospital preferences rather than it does with tailoring, tailoring which of these two would typically be used based on individual patient characteristics. In terms of what's known, the protective effect of PPIs on upper GI bleeding is fairly clear, but the comparative mortality of PPIs versus H2RBs is very much unknown. It's not going to be a huge effect because this would have been known from observational studies. So if it exists, it could still be in a small effect, but because they're applied to so many patients, the, uh, the, uh, the clinical importance of this in the population will be very large, even if it's a small effect. So you'd need to have a large comparative effectiveness trial to be able to investigate these two. So let's look at the individually randomized trial option and the sample size needed for that. So it would be randomizing um, mechanically ventilated patients to either PPI or H2RBs. The in-hospital mortality for mechanically ventilated patients is about 15%. And suppose we want to detect a 15% reduction in this mortality with 80% power, corresponds to an absolute reduction of about 2.3%. Um, suppose each site recruits patients over a period of six months from the uh, APD, the adult patient registry. Um, sites typically have about 310 patients on average over a six month period. So this trial would need, uh, going through standard power calculation, about 7,400 patients across 24 sites. Would this trial be possible to be individually randomized? The answer is yes, it could with enough uh, funding and enough effort, but it's quite prohibitive really in terms of cost and of logistics to conduct and would need individual consent. So really in terms of a practical design, we need to look at an alternative study design and the first one to look at are cluster randomized designs where you randomize uh, whole uh, units or clusters of, uh, of individuals. And you, um, instead of an individual being randomized, you randomize the whole cluster. So here it could be an intensive care unit. The whole intensive care unit gets uh, randomized. And the alternative study design here could have outcomes collected via registry, and a simplified consent process because these are routinely used interventions. So one might entitle this sort of design as a registry embedded cluster randomized trial design. So here's the schematic of some cluster randomized trial designs. So the clusters could be intensive care units, could be general practices or schools. These are typical uh, units used in these types of designs across different application areas. So the first design at the top here is a parallel cluster trial design. For each cluster, I think if in each intensive care unit is randomized either to uh, you know, treatment A or treatment B, you might call it intervention versus control. And the cluster is randomized to one of those and they maintain that uh, intervention throughout the whole period of the trial. The middle diagram is an example of a cluster crossover trial design where each cluster crosses over from treatment A to treatment B. And in this diagram, it goes back to treatment A and B again. So each cluster receives both treatments for a specific period of time for each treatment. And the diagram at the bottom is a step wedge design where there's no switchback between um, going from intervention back to control, where all designs, where all, um, all clusters start off in the control condition and end up in the intervention condition. 
and Patty Chandros is going to be talking in detail about these designs, so I won't say anything more about that at the moment. So first, let's consider the parallel cluster randomized trial. Um, for a cluster randomized trial, we need to consider the clustering effects, and I'll explain briefly how that arises. So in terms of clustering effects of mortality, mortality, uh, the mortality rate is going to vary across intensive care units due to case mix differences across units and also hospital practices, et cetera. So there will be some mortality variation. And that means that patients within the same ICU are going to be more similar in their underlying mortality risk than patients across different ICUs. And this leads to what's called a within ICU correlation. And the impact of this is you don't get independent pieces of information per patient. And that means you're losing information and your effective sample size from using a cluster trial design is smaller than the total number of patients. So the effective sample size per ICU is actually smaller than the number of patients per ICU. Good. Uh, so let's look at a sample size for a parallel cluster randomized trial design. Uh, we can use this uh, as uh, the intensive care registry data to help with certain design parameters. This within ICU correlation is 0.03. An ICU with 310 patients has got equivalent information to only 26 independent patients. So there's a massive loss of information due to clustering. And this results in this trial for a 15% reduction in mortality would need 88,000 patients in 284 ICUs. So that's clearly beyond the realm of uh, being able to be conducted. So we've got a bit of a delay here with looking through the slides. It's just skipped a slide. Okay, so an alternative to the parallel cluster randomized design is the cluster crossover design, where you incorporate a crossover element into the trial. So in terms of this um, intensive care unit trial, each intensive care unit would be randomized to either have a PPIs for a six month period and then cross over to implement H2RBs for a six month period or vice versa. And the advantage of this is that you can make the comparison between these two interventions by doing that within each ICU because each ICU gets both interventions and then aggregate that. And by making the comparison within ICUs, we're going to be reduced, uh, removing the between intensive care unit variability. So the end result of this is that cluster randomized crossover trials typically need a much smaller number of intensive care units and a smaller number of patients than parallel cluster randomized trials. But how much smaller is smaller? Okay, we've got a trial now where we've got two six month observation periods. It turns out we need to consider two correlations, the two forms of within cluster correlations. The first one we've covered already is the clustering correlation, and this is a bad correlation. We lose, uh, we lose information from this clustering. But there is a second form of correlation, and that's a correlation between patients in the same ICU across different periods, which is called the between period correlation. And this is actually a good correlation. This is a correlation due to the crossover, because Typically, when you're comparing interventions A and B, you want everything to be alike between the patients receiving A and patients receiving B, apart from the treatment being received. So in the intensive care unit setting, the more similar patients are from the first period to the second period, the better off we're going to be in terms of precision. So I've got these two correlations, which I'll technically denote as the bad and the good. And the relative size of these determines the value of the crossover element in the cluster crossover design. 
So the general concept is we want to wind back the clustering effect by incorporating the crossover. On the left-hand edge here, we've got the sample size of 7,400 patients for an individually randomized trial. On the right-hand end, the parallel cluster trial with 88,000 patients. We want to wind some of that clustering effect back by crossing over. And the amount wound back depends on the ratio of the good to the bad correlation, approximately. So let's now look at implementing a cluster crossover trial for this uh, comparison of PPIs versus H2RBs. And this actually was the design for this peptic randomized trial that's just recently been published. Um, uh, using the uh, adult patient database, the bad correlation as previously was 0.035, you can also calculate the good correlation of 0.025. So good over bad is about 71%. So it looks like we're gonna be having some good benefits from the crossover. In terms of the sample size to detect a 15% reduction with an average of 310 patients per six months, we need 50 ICUs and 31,000 patients. So putting all these bits of information together, an individually randomized trial, we need 7,400 patients, cluster trial, 88,000, cluster with crossover, back down to 31,000. So about two thirds or 66% of the clustering effect has been recovered. So the clustering has been very useful here. And this led to this peptic cluster crossover trial and it was published in JAMA in January of this year. It's got the reference there. So there were 27,000 patients in this trial across 50 ICUs, open label treatments conducted across five countries and with a budget because of being embedded within a registry, 27,000 patients for under half a million US dollars, which is quite remarkable. The consent was really important here. It varied according to local HREX, but we were able to either get a complete waiver of consent or opt-out consent. And the opt-out rate was very, very low, 0.6%. The data resources collected in the trial were a combination of registry, but also some trial specific elements. So from the registries were the baseline characteristics, some ventilation information where that was available. And then the primary outcome was mortality, but we also had length of stays. The site specific resources, which had to be collected on an individual patient basis locally were upper GI bleeds and C. diff infections. We didn't, we weren't able to get comprehensive individual level use of which treatments are actually used for each patient. So we had to rely on monthly single day audits rather than having comprehensive individual information. So going to the results of this peptic trial. So result number one, registry randomized, cluster randomized trials are great. The mortality was 18.3% in the PPI condition and 17.5% in H2RB. Relatively similar, but that's a 5% increase the confidence interval was 1.00 to 1.10. So very, very tight confidence interval here. So even though this difference looks very small, um, the confidence interval was very narrow. And this result turned out to be more precise than was anticipated. And it turns out one can do some calculations that this trial had the same precision as an individually randomized trial of 27,000 patients. And why is this so? Uh, the reason is we actually got lucky. So Ronaldo Bolomo, one of the major investigators said, there's no such thing as good luck. It's just uh, good planning and good conduct. But I think we got lucky here. The good correlation was very, very close to the bad correlation. And so this is the best case scenario for cluster crossover designs. And you can't necessarily consider that this is always going to happen. The second set of results is the cluster based registry trials are not so great. And this is exactly because of some of the data that wasn't available within the registry. The adherence differed between the conditions or as much as we could tell from these audit snapshots. In the PPI period, there was pretty good compliance with 82% of the patients receiving PPI, but the H2B, H2RB periods only 64% received H2RBs and quite you know, a fifth received PPIs. And this muddied the interpretation of the trial. And because we didn't have individual level compliance data, 
we couldn't do a really sort of sophisticated um, compliance adjusted analysis. So some overall comments here about this peptic trial in the registries. The embedding in a registry was actually the greatest asset for the peptic trial, but also ended up being the greatest limitation this compliance turned out to be a major issue with both the reviewers from JAMA and also correspondence from the readers. And this is the single bit of information that we had the least, um, the least capacity to address questions about. But overall, um, this PEPTIC trial was an overwhelming success. The site recruitment, the content, consent and participation, the registry outcome, data collected uh, was uh, functioned absolutely superbly. We got lucky with the precision and this peptic trial is actually the largest intensive care unit trial um, ever conducted and we've got the precision here of an individually randomized 27,000 patient trial. Now but that doesn't mean you can convert every individually individual randomized uh, individual patient randomized trial into a cluster crossover trial. There are certain criteria that you need to be able to do that. The treatments need to be able to be essentially switched on and off very, very quickly. And with all, as with all crossover trials, you need to avoid carryover effects lingering from the first to the second period. And in here in a cluster setting, you've got carryover, potential for carryover at the site level at the individual level, but you can do something about these in the design of the trial with uh, factors such as washout periods. For cluster crossover trials, you really do want all comers. You don't really want to have individual patient selection after randomization, which is well known to lead to selection bias in cluster randomized trials. And of course, best if you can blind treatments. So the final comments now about cluster crossover uh, trials embedded within a registry. Actually, the cluster crossover trial design is really almost purpose built for conduct within a registry, and especially so for comparative effectiveness trials, especially routinely used interventions, where in a registry you can take essentially all comers with appropriate consent being either waiver or opt out. As mentioned, the crossover can reduce the number of clusters or units dramatically and also the number of patients, often tremendously. I've only shown the most basic cluster crossover design. You can cross over multiple times and there's potential for developing factorial trials, adaptive trials, etc. But as with all cluster randomized trials, these are more prone to bias than individual patient randomized trials. So you do need care in the design and you may need to do quite a bit of supplementation to the registry based data collection to be able to have data to address questions about those biases. So thank you very much. And I look forward to um, addressing any questions that might come up when we have the question time at the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew.